Then is obviously the Connex ovens of Merry Chef. So we currently have or are phasing out our Icon ovens, our E2Ss. Um, basically, it's just a facelift predominantly. They're called uh, Connex because they, do, they now come with connectivity. So you can now connect the oven to the internet where you would have a Kitchen Connect account, um, which is free for the first 12 months. Potentially, then there would be a subscription fee afterwards. But that gives you the ability to log on to your oven while you're sunning yourself on holiday or sat at home. But also for large accounts, if you're doing a menu change, currently we send out USBs uh, to our key accounts with a new menu on, and they have to pop into the USB port down here and then upload the new menu. With connectivity, we could sit in the office send the, uh, a program to the oven to, or tell the software to say, let's say two o'clock on a Monday morning, send the file to all the ovens. The operator comes in on Monday morning, switches the oven on and it will say new menu available. Do you wish to download? Yes or no? Press yes, a couple of minutes, new menus on and they start the day with their new menu. So it's all about the connectivity uh, across the range. And it, it is for everything this day and age now, like a lot of our new equipment, whether it be our fryers and our combi ovens, everything's all gonna be connectivity. Um, just to make things easier for the, the end user really. I think the most important thing having the connectivity if you do log the oven onto the internet is if you have a fault, you then could ring us up, give us your password to our service department. They could then log into the oven and find out what the error code was, what the fault was, which in theory then means you don't have to send an engineer out twice because you'd go out, diagnose it, maybe say, I haven't got the part, I'll come back tomorrow. Whereas this way you could log in online look at the errors and go, right, I'm gonna turn up tomorrow and I'll take this, this and this, and it's a one trip visit then. So it can save you time and labor and set on engineer visits. So it, that part is very, very good. So basically what we've done, we've upgraded the screen. As you can see, it's more like, I would say, a touchpad, iPad type technology. Um, I've got this currently set up in full service mode. Generally, most customers, once the menu is created, you would lock it out into quick serve mode so that nobody can change anything. You don't want them to mess about with your programs and your recipes. You only want one person in, in control of all of that. So similar to the icon, but as you can see, a lot better detail. We've got recipe creation. That's where we would, if I'm doing food development or testing a customer's uh, product, set a temperature, a time, a fan speed, a microwave uh, power, test the product, and then review that product. Is it okay in regards to color, texture, core temperature? If it's not, we come back to the screen, we make a change and we test again. Once we're happy, we then have the option to save that program. Um, I haven't put anything, so it's not gonna save anything at the moment. You then save it. Once it's saved, what you're relying on is consistency. If the product is consistent going into the oven, that program will consistently deliver the same cook every time. At the minute you change the parameters of the, of the product, for example, if you say it's a tablespoon of grated cheese into a sandwich and somebody decides to use their hand and use a lot more, the oven's not going to understand that. It's not going to know that unless you tell it. So, of course, the program designed at one tablespoon of cheese will not be as effective if it's a big handful of cheese. So it's all about consistency. Pictures can be in there a lot better now, uh, a lot more color detail, which I'll show you now through the cookbook. You see a lot brighter, uh, a lot more detail. You can take your own pictures, you put them on a USB stick, you pop the USB stick into the port, and when you're saving your recipes, you can select your pictures yourself. So you can have the photograph the customer's own products. So this is just a, a generic factory settings that we've got in here. If I go to breakfast, just a few on there. Now, if I wasn't happy with everything the way the screen is laid out, I can press and hold and drag a program and put it to where I, I wish it to be. So again, similar to touchpad technology that we have. Also, if you notice, if I press and hold it, it comes up with edit or delete. So if I don't like that program, I can throw it away. But if I want to change it, edit, because we've changed, let's for example, this is a bacon roll. If I change the, the bacon supplier and the bacon's not cooking the same, then I can just go into that pre-made program and just edit whatever section I require, whether that be fan speed time or microwave power. You press the save again just to make sure and it's telling you the title that you put in. We have got more information in our programs now when we create them, whereas on the icon it was literally time, temperature, fan, microwave, save, give it a name, job done. Now we've got things like, is the product ambient or chilled? How many portions are you cooking? What's the weight of the product you're cooking? And this is just information that it gathers during the day. So if you wanted to, like I said, with the Kitchen Connect system, you can go into the oven and go, oh, okay, so we cooked X amount of chilled items 
or frozen items, and this can be brought up on the screen as well, uh, how many portions we cooked, or if a new member of staff comes in and says, well, what's the weight of this piece of chicken I'm cooking? The recipe's already in the system. Uh, that's in the statistics, that's in another part, but we do have that. It tells you when, how, how many times the oven's on throughout the day, what buttons have been pressed, um, and we can go through that. If we just back out. So go to, go to settings. Now, the password is all the same on all our equipment and our ovens, and it's manager. Should anyone ever change that, the serial number will always get you in, no matter what. So slightly different in the settings, we've got about, which tells us things like the firmware updates when the oven was born. I've updated this, so we're now on, all ovens leaving the factory should be on 2.0.1. Uh, and I updated this one this morning, because it was on a slower one, or a different version. Um, modes, full serve, which I said we're in, quick serve, press and go, manual, locked, energy save, showing favorites, serving recipes, lots of different ways you can have the main screen displayed. Like I said, nine times out of 10, it'll probably be locked out once it's done and it will be just, all of these will be off apart from quick serve where everything else will be disabled and all they can do is cook and clean, nothing else. Then if we go down all these bit by bit, preheats, just got one on there. You can have as many as you want. Most customers will only have one, maybe two. Um, if they're doing some products that they wanna cook at a really lower temperature, they might have a lower setting. Or if I was normally doing a demonstration, I normally have a, when I do training on site, I set one up as off so that I can do the cleaning training at the start of the uh, presentation to the staff while the oven's cold rather than wait for it to cool down. <coughs> and then you disable. Languages, just like all our uh, ovens in the past, you can have different languages. The oven doesn't translate though, that's important. If you say to me, well, the customer wants it in French or Spanish or whatever, we would take the file off the oven I would send it to one of my colleagues around the globe, French chef, Spanish chef, etc., and I'd say, can you just translate all that for me? They would send, send it back and you'd have the option and the menu done. And you'd highlight which menu, uh, languages you want, and then you have a globe on the screen, you just tap it and it goes to the next language that you've set it for, if you need to. Date and time, obviously a standard. Scheduler, you can program the oven to switch itself on every day of the week or off any time of the week if you wish or lower the temperature to cool down in the afternoons um, it's a feature that's there it's a feature I've never used as yet display so unlike our icon ovens you couldn't really change anything on the display other than the screensaver here we can control the brightness you can set a visual warning uh, we've got default screensaver here you can change the way the screensaver reacts on the screen so if you didn't want uh, scatter or you just wanted a large bounce, you can preview what you've got. Now, if I press the tick, it now says, would you like to customize the screens over? So you can take the customer's branding and put that on there as well for them, which I think is always beneficial if the oven's facing the, uh, the, the patrons that are coming into the, uh, the cafe or the store. So we'll say no, but if again, you'd have it on a USB in the port and it'll access that for you. You can set how long you want the screen saver to engage. We'll discard those. Sounds. There is only one sound. It's all really though whether you want it to bleep every time they touch the screen, which can be really annoying. If you switch that off, it will only bleep when the doors open or when the program is finished. And then it's just a case of setting the volume. And again, you would set that on site once you know where the oven is. Again, if it's in back of house, potentially you're gonna want it louder so the staff out front can hear it. If it's front of house, you might want it a little bit quieter. Media library. So this is where we could add obviously more photographs if we wanted to, and also the audio library, where we had different sounds for warnings, errors, and cook done. The moment, we're keeping it all the same for now. Then you've got units, so you can do metric or imperial. Passwords, we've already talked about statistics. So, oven statistics. We've got this on the icon range, but it just shows you, you can see uh, obviously the heater on, the mag time's on, door operations, and it's all in real time. There we go. Then we've got culinary statistics. And this is where I said, everything you press and cook, it will tell you how many times you've pressed that button, how many products you've cooked, which is quite good if, you, if your POS, POS system is working properly as well. You could say, well, we sold 20 pizzas today. How many did we actually cook? Well, we cooked 22. 
So where's the other two? Is that staff meals? Is it theft? Is it wastage? Um, so you can you know, put those two together if you wish. And then obviously here, ambient, chilled and frozen. Because I've reset this this morning, we haven't cooked anything yet. But the, bar, uh, the, the pie chart then will show what percentage of everything you've cooked is chilled, frozen or ambient. It could be relevant to some people. And then operational statistics. And here we go. So this tells you now what time of the day the oven's operating or week or month because I've rebooted it or we've only been playing with it briefly this morning I think I did a couple of bacon rolls at 9 o'clock it says 9 o'clock uh, then there's week and then there's month so you will see a chart of when the oven's working now if you want to know how much it costs to run the oven you can take that information go to the energy calculator on the Merry Chef website tell the oven what time the oven was switched on how many hours it was running as in cooking how many hours it's in standby, which it is now, which means it's hot, it's waiting to be worked on. Um, put in what you pay per kilowatt for your area, and it will give you then an al a calculated running cost for the day. Uh, so I can never give you an exact price because every customer is different, every area is different. Um, you know, you might not switch the oven on till 11 o'clock and switch it off at 2 o'clock. So it's going to be a different running cost to somebody who switches it on at 4 in the morning and leaves it running all day long. The connectivity we've mentioned briefly. So a customer would uh, go into Wi-Fi settings. They can enable their Wi-Fi if they've got it available. And then they can, or there is an Ethernet connection as well. And then they can set the oven up on the Wi-Fi. Then they go to the Kitchen Connect settings, and this is for the end user. Scan the QR code. All the information about the oven they've got is there. They scan that. It takes them to our Kitchen Connect account. They then click on all the buttons relevant, enter their address, their name, etc., and then they can have a Kitchen Connect account. Like I said, it's 12 months free subscription first, and then somebody who runs the Kitchen Connect system will then be in touch to discuss what they want to do, you know, after the subscription. At the moment, we're not charging anyone just yet. But that gives them all that active stuff that they can do from wherever. They can do exactly what I'm doing, but do it off, uh, you know, at home. Cleaning. So cleaning is greatly improved. It's always been our sort of a bugbear on our other ovens where the information on the screen was very limited. It would be cool down, clean cavity, add protector, clean filter. That was it. Um, now we've got everything. I can still give you an A4 page, which you can stick on the oven, but you don't need it. Everything on that A4 page that we used to give out is now on the screen. When I do the cleaning now, I actually tell people, press the cleaning button and I'll step aside. Any questions, you ask me. Every little bit of information they need is on there. We have three options that can be added or deleted from the cleaning schedule. The cool down oven with ice, which <coughs> comes with the metal pan. If they want to cool down the oven a lot quicker, we give them a pan which they fill with ice or cold water and they can cool that down. If they don't wish to do that, they can disable that bit. Use oven protector. We always recommend our chemicals. The protector is what puts a barrier on the oven between the dirt of the food and the oven itself after you've cleaned it, making cleaning so much easier. I always highly recommend protector. Even if you don't buy the cleaner, buy a protector because that's the one that makes things easy, especially if you're cooking raw protein, sausage, bacon, the grease, it's gonna be dirty. But if you don't buy it and you don't wanna use a protector, again, you can disengage that. And then the last one here is providing a cleaning sign off. We never used to do this. Um, what we do now is when the oven comes around to asking you to clean the filter, which is at the bottom here, that information will come on the screen. You will have no indication that you can press a green tick. It will not move on until you've actually physically removed the filter. Once you've done that and you press the tick, the next screen will be provide a cleaning sign off and a keyboard will come up. And again, the green tick will disappear until somebody enters a name you cannot shut the oven down. So you're, you're sort of, and like I said, you can disable it, but you're protecting yourself to find out that who was in yesterday who cleaned the oven, which is really important. So you can have that as an extra as well. Once you put a name in, you press the tick, that appears, and then the oven will power itself down, just like our other previous ovens. As you can see, there are no rocker switches, there's no on-off switches. The on-off switch is the screen itself. Before you power it down, the one thing I always say is, though, just make sure you wipe the screen with the sanitizer before you touch uh, the, the sign off button because if you powers down and then you go and wipe it, you touch the screen, you're going to switch it on again. So we take all that and that is that. If I come out and show you where the cleaning is, if I press that, the first thing it tells somebody to do, assemble your personal protective equipment, your PPE and your cleaning materials. So it's telling you, go get your stuff before you start. 
and then it will ask you to cool the oven. Fill with a cool down pan, with ice, place on the oven, leave the door slightly or fully open. So to cool it down faster, obviously we want to blow the hot air out. Um, you don't have to do it that way, but it will take longer. But as you can see, it's highlighted in blue what you're supposed to do. Every section, every screen after this now will tell you what to do. You don't need to train it in anymore because it's already there. So what we're going to do now, we're going to do a little bit of cooking. So we've got here a cookbook that's already preloaded. As you can see, we've got a lot of sections here. So you can have as many categories as you want. And within those categories, you can have as many recipes as you want. So for us here today, we've got all recipes. That is basically the library. That's every recipe that's on this oven. Now there may be recipes in there that are not allocated to a category, such as Christmas lines, Christmas toasty, uh, a mince pie. You only want to bring them out of the library uh, when you're serving your Christmas menus. January comes, you put them back in the library out of the way if you don't need them. Like I said, it's a, a touch screen so you can scroll up and down. So we'll press that, our breakfast items, and now we've got in here, uh, again, a selection of items for breakfast. So now this, I'm gonna do two bacon rolls. So what I've got here, two bacon rolls. So what I've done this morning is I've pre-cooked the bacon uh, without too much color, chilled it down, and then I've assembled the bacon rolls which would be on display. Customer comes in, says you want a bacon roll. You take the bacon roll, place it on the tray, now, I'm just going to lay them open because I now want to add extra colour inside the, uh, the, the bread roll, to toast the edges and grill the bacon. Now, I go to my product here, it says two bacon rolls. I press it, now it knows I haven't opened the oven door, so it's reminding me, it wants to double check. So I slide the product in, take them out. Oh, now it says, lay the rolls open with bacon on both sides. So again, it's checking me, have I done a, a control step, which I have. So there are instructions that you can put on the oven to enhance your product and help the staff when they're doing the training. By doing it this way, like I said, I'm toasting the, bake, uh, the bread roll, I'm also grilling the bacon a bit more. If I did it closed, I've got to get all the energy to go through the top of the bread to just heat up the bacon, which would be then steamed. Um, this way, it's quicker, adds a bit more colour and texture, and the flavour and the smell is a lot more enhanced this way. Uh, and it would be the same for sausage back as well. When I do a sausage one, we pre-cook the sausages, cut them in half and lay them open onto the bread. The meat is protecting the bread from not drying out too much. And at the same there we go. Now, as you can see now, we've caramelized the fat around the bacon and we've toasted the edges of the bread. So that now looks like a freshly grilled bacon sandwich in 35 seconds. You're gonna get a pizza paddle. This is what we call our safety paddle because it's got raised edges. So when you get the black tray that is supplied with it, it doesn't slide off. You also have a knuckle guard because this oven is running at 275 degrees and nobody wants to drag their knuckles across that. So it's very safe. Now, as long as you hold the handle, that 275 degrees is not gonna burn you, okay? The minute you decide to let go and do something, or if some people decide to, oh, I'll cook inside the oven with tongs or a spatula and reach in, you are then at risk. So this is why you are supplied with a safety pizza paddle, as we call it, one black tray, and one brown Teflon mat. Now the reason we have two different things here, you can cook direct on that hot cook plate, that hot shelf, that is 275 degrees, and we'll do a pizza on that shortly. That then heat adds the color underneath or the texture to your product. If you don't want so much color or texture, you cook on a Teflon mat, it's a little bit thinner, uh, a thin, should I say, uh, but it will still transfer heat. If you don't want any color through certain products, then you use the black tray, because it's thicker, the heat is then, being resisted against the black thickness of that tray and therefore it's less. And then the more thickness you put on here, the less texture, color and brownish you're getting from underneath off the cook plate. So you'll see me sometimes we'll cook things on a piece of greaseproof paper. So a sheet of greaseproof paper, it's very thin, it can brown the product, the heat will penetrate because it's a contact. You can then obviously wrap the product in that paper and serve it. If you are cooking on paper, it's one use, one cook, throw it away or hand it out. You don't cook twice on paper because there's always a risk eventually it will break down. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you don't use printed or inked papers. Just basically parchment or greaseproof. Most of those work. Silicon paper is good. These come, so like I said, every customer will get one of this. That's the setup with every oven. Now, because we don't know what the end user is going to be using the oven for, we don't know what I have to supply. So these are consumables. They will need replacing over time but you can get different colors. So you can get the square trays in red, blue, green. You can get half size, quarter size. So you might be doing, for example, 
multiple items in an oven at the same time. So I use this sort of configuration normally when I'm doing a rack of ribs, some chicken wings and some potato wedges, all in the oven at the same time, but in different containers so they don't transfer flavors, but they also cook easier that way. The Teflon mats, you get the brown one, but there is a green, again, for vegetarian, and there's a purple, allergens. And we also have a large square tray in purple as well for allergens. So if you are, obviously you're facing the customer with your oven, you've got products that are vegetarian, people wanna see you making the difference that you are using a green tray or a green mat. Or if you've got allergens, again, if you're facing customers, you've gotta make the effort to show that you're, you're using a gluten-free product, we're gonna cook it on that, okay? So they're available. My advice is always, again, talk to the customer before they purchase the oven and maybe come together with a starter kit. The chemicals, the oven cleaner, the oven protector, and numerous pieces of equipment such as these accessories, the trays, the half size, the full size. If they're cooking uh, other items they want to have a look at, we've got our signature range, which is a harder plastic, almost indestructible, can go up to 300 degrees centigrade, it's non-metallic, so it's safe in, the, in a microwave. Um, we've got a bowl here for reheating soups, chilies, wet dishes. We do uh, a mold for fried eggs, for poached eggs. I use this tray here, which has got raised edges to make an omelet in. Um, there are lots more of containers. So it's about, again, like I said, looking at their menu, seeing what they want to use the oven, and put that starter pack together so that when the oven arrives on site, they haven't just got the one tray and the one mat, and then they've got to wait a week for other trays and other accessories because people then tend not to clean the tray you know, throughout the day because it's the only one they've got. So it just gets dirty and then you're just cooking that dirt over and over and over again. So I always say buy or come together at the st when you're looking to sell the oven and come together with an idea of what materials and accessories you think you need. You can cook direct on this cook plate if it's nice and clean. Um, and it's great for things like pizzas or toasties. So if that's what you want to get, that really extra crisp, you put no barrier at all. However, some people with those, I need to cook on the paper or the Teflon mat, which is fine, but then you've got to consider that in the time of your program and maybe it'll have to stay in the oven for maybe an extra 15, 20 seconds to get that heat to penetrate whatever barrier you put between the cook plate and the product. Teflon mat, um, yes. that can go directly onto the... If you want to, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's have, we'll have a go. We'll do a toasty. So, we'll place that on there. We'll take a toasted sandwich. So this is just ham and cheese, sliced bread. I said safety paddle, just slide it off, put it out. It's designed to sit on top of the oven. The ovens are cool to touch. We go to our toasties. I've got one, let's press that and away we go. So it's 275 degrees in there. It's cool to touch. There's cold air coming out here because there's a fan at the base here that's sending cool air around the oven, so you can put things on top. It's nice and safe. They do not need to be under extraction because of that center. They are what we call a ventless oven, so uh, everything that's in there, the hot air is going through a catalytic converter as well as another heating element to heat it back up, clean it up, and put it back into the oven. So you shouldn't be getting all your smokes and smells and greases going up into the air. Um, the minute you do that, it means you probably overcooking a lot of products. Like if you do trays of sausage or bacon, all our ovens can do in limited quantities. What we would say is do a tray of bacon, give the oven a minute or for the catalytic converter to recover, and then do another one. What we don't want you doing is tray after tray after tray after tray. By the time you get to tray four or five, you open that door, your smoke's coming out the front because the catalytic converter hasn't had time to recover. So, three, two, one. Beep. Cook is finished, Beep. remove the item. So you just, as you can see, the, pa the uh, paper there or the mat lifts up from the fan system. So this is the impingement forced hot air from above. And because it was on a hot cook plate, that is the base. Yeah, nice and simple. So it's toasted both sides. If you wanted a better toast on both sides, you can, and some products, depending on the type of bread, you may have to turn the toasty over halfway through. But mo no, most breads will toast perfectly well, just like that. Now we'll take that to there. The once you've got that timing set down, the only difference that changes then is how much microwave for one toasty, two toasty, three toasty, four. Generally, you can do one toasty in 60 seconds. It usually means I can do three and four in 60 seconds as well. Pretty the same interior, 12 by 12 inch cavity. It's really more of a facelift on the, on the control panels. The E4 and the E4S, uh, E4 is 12 by 14, E4S is 14 by 14, but both of those will be phased out at some point and replaced by the Con Connex 16, yeah. 
which looks exactly the same as this, slightly bigger, but is a 16 by 16 inch cavity. So, and it has, supposedly has the same catalytic converter as the E4, uh, but, and it has more microwave power. So the E4s, generally our ovens were, E3 was 700 watts, uh, E2S standard power is 1,000 watts microwave, high power 2,000 watts microwave, um, E4 was uh, 1,500 watts microwave. The Connect 16 is going to have 2,000 watts or up to 2,000 watts of microwave, so it will be more powerful. So that's the same impingement power that the E4 has, um, just got a bigger cavity and a little bit, about 25% more microwave energy. So, yeah, just looks be it looks better as well, obviously. They'll all look the same. The E1S is a 12 by 12 inch cavity, but only has 800 watts of microwave mm -hmm. and will only go to a maximum temperature of 260 degrees running off a 13 amp three pin plug. So it's a, it's a as I said earlier, it's, it's the lesser powered of these accelerated cooking platforms, but it's a little bit faster than the E3. But the E3 will never go away because we can use that as a bake off oven. It doesn't have impingement, it's just a fan assisted oven with 700 watts of microwave. It was our, you know, our first gen oven many, many years ago, and it suits a lot of customers who don't have the space to buy a separate piece of equipment, another oven for baking. Um, whereas the E3 will do both of those. So. Okay, so we're gonna show how easy it is to do a pizza. Now, this is a pre-cooked base, so a chilled pizza. On average, most chilled pizzas in that format will take around 90 seconds. If it's a frozen product, it might take a little bit more. We would add a bit more microwave. You can do fresh dough, but it's a little bit more tricky trying to get the fresh dough to slide off the uh, pizza paddle onto the cook plate, but I have made it work. So here we're gonna to go to pizza, and I've got two programmed in here already, a meat or veg 12 inch, and a margarita 12 inch. And the reason they're different is because the ingredients will react different. If you cook one with a lot of vegetables on, or pineapple, heaven forbid, um, you've got more water, therefore you're gonna need a bit more microwave energy to get the core temperature. If you've got things like this, which is just pure cheese, microwave loves cheese, loves fat, so it will activate and cook this a lot quicker. So that's why we end up with different ones. Now again, I'm just sliding it in, pull the paddle out. Now I'm cooking this direct on the cook plate so that I can give it the maximum heat from that cook plate, no barriers of trays or paper to help crisp up and color that base. Now I've only bought this pizza this morning. I've never tested this one before. So the idea would be we would cook it, review it. If it needed more, we would change the program to suit. But generally, here you see 90 seconds, 70% fan, so that's 275 degrees being blown down at 70%. If that was 100% fan, that would be nearly 60 miles an hour of that hot air, 275 degrees coming down, which is faster than any salamander grill that you have. And then 30% microwave. Now when we say 30%, that is 1,000 watts of energy for 30% of that time. So the, the computer then takes the, pro, the power rating and goes, right, I'm gonna be on, I'm gonna be off, I'm gonna be on, and I'm gonna be off. And it will be on for 30% of the time. If that was 100%, it would then be one constant beam of energy. So it's always giving you the 1,000 watts or up to 1,000 watts, but it breaks it down into a wave pattern. That's giving the food then time to bubble up because it's getting hit with microwave and then relax. And then bubble up and then relax. I mean, it is fast, but when you're waiting for it, it seems like it's forever. So you have two cappuccinos, madam, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Two, one. There we go. So we'll have a look at this. So probably needs a touch more, because like I said, I haven't tested this one. We've got good caramelization for the most part. Um, the texture is there, but that's 90 seconds. So that's not bad. Mm -hmm. You know, we just really require now, I would look at that, I would edit the fan speed uh, and maybe put it in for another 10 seconds and then that would, uh, next time round, be perfect. And like I said, then it's about consistency. But I am gonna finish that off because... Now what I've got here, the best, the best of it here is when I set it in here, I've got boost programs, which I put on all our ovens anyway just in case, for whatever reason, especially if somebody's saying you defrost your food the day before, 
and it hasn't fully reached proper fridge temperature the next day, if let's say it's at minus one or zero degrees, again, the program doesn't know that. So you go, well, I've tried it. Oh, it's still not quite right in the middle. I'll just add a little boost 10 second microwave or uh, some color just to finish it off if you need to. It's, it's better to have them there than for somebody to go, oh, well, that's no good. I'll throw that away and start again. We're back on for a full program. Yeah, or a full program, yeah. And then they forget. But yeah, that extra 10 seconds, just added on a bit more color. That is lovely. You can hear the crispness of that. Pizza for breakfast, anyone? And there we go. Generally, a 90 second couple of sausage rolls. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, we're not, it's not a bake-off oven, our E3 is a bake-off oven. The rest of our range are not bake-off capable. So what we're gonna do here is this is a pre-cooked sausage roll that's been chilled down, stored in a fridge, but we wanna give it to a customer that's warm. Uh, so what we do is we place it on our tray, slide it into the oven. I've got here a program, a category called Savory Reheats. And in here we've got sausage rolls, meat pies, etc. So we'll pick our two sausage rolls. And what I'm trying to do now is add microwave to heat up the sausage meat to get a safe core temperature. But then the hot air is starting to crisp up the pastry again and make it look like it's just come out of an oven after 25 minutes, freshly baked. And that's the other advantage of this technology. Like I said, if you, if you do have a bake-off concept and you've got another oven where you do all your bakery, you can then chill all that food down, store for up to three days safely, and then just reheat to order. The customer believes he's getting freshly baked food all every time so we're working with pie companies like Pucker uh, and that as well who love the idea of this um, to heat up a whole Pucker pie in sort of 90 seconds and again the customer doesn't can tell it's not been microwaved yeah. the, the microwave draws out moisture it makes pastry soft and soggy jacket potatoes soft and yeah. soggy but the hot air environment yeah. takes away that moisture and makes the pastry and the potato crisper And you can see the colour we've added there and the texture and that's piping hot. We probably could have got away with about five seconds less on that potentially but like I said this is all part of the testing when you get a, sausage, a product or like today I just again a new sausage roll I've not tested before. That looks great we would tweak it set it perfectly but again now the customer's going to eat that and get crispy paper. Cleaning of the oven. Press the cleaning icon. Now all the instructions will be provided on the screen. As you can see, screen one, assemble personal protective equipment, PPE, and cleaning materials. We've done that. Press the green tick to the next screen. Now it's asking you to fill down the pan that is supplied with the oven with ice. And if you haven't got ice, cold water will suffice. You can use nothing at all, but it will take longer. This then goes into the oven, onto the cook plate. Now you can leave the door slightly ajar or fully open but you must warn people that you're cleaning the oven because this is 275 degrees and there will be hot air coming out. You can do it with the door closed, but again, it will take longer. So we've already got this oven cold, so this is gonna be quite quick. It's gonna aim for 50 degrees. Once it's reached 50 degrees centigrade, it now tells you to remove the cool down pan and the cook plate. Now these are gonna be around 50 degrees. They are gonna be warm. So we'd still recommend that you use a safety uh, oven glove or a cloth, but like I said, I've already got this cold. Now this would go into the dishwasher. As you can see, the cook plate may be hot. Use heat proof gloves. Anything blue is identifying what you're supposed to be doing at that step. You press the tick. Remove food particles. So with a brush, You'd get down here in between the door where some crumbs may have fallen out. The rest you can wipe out with a damp cloth. And again, it's asking you to wear your PPE goggles, for example. You don't want crumbs getting into your face. Press the tick. Now, spray an approved oven cleaner onto a sponge. So Mary Chef have their own chemicals here. Oven cleaner, oven protector. We'll get to the protector later. You would spray this onto a cloth. You are not spraying into the cavity. If you spray into the cavity, you have holes at the back. You would just be sending chemical through the back of the oven. And you tend to use too much if you spray inside the oven. So spraying onto a cloth allows you then to wipe to the sides, the back, the base, the door plate, ignoring the door seal 
and ignoring the roof. We do not put chemicals on the roof and we do not put chemicals on the rubber door seals. And again, it says here, avoid door seals and roof of cavity. Do not spray directly in the cavity. So anything in yellow is a hazard warning to you. Press the tick. Wait for five to 10 minutes for the cleaner to work. Clean the cook plate in warm soapy water, which we've done. Or like I said, you can put it in the dishwasher, but you want it quick and easy. So the warm soapy water is fine. Dry it with a dry cloth or paper towel is what we'll be using. Press the tick. So clean the cavity and door using a non-abrasive sponge. So that's your nylon green sponges, not your wire walls or your Brillo pads. Wipe off the cleaner with a clean wet cloth. Generally we use just a bit of paper towel that's damp. And then you would dry again with a clean cloth or paper towel. Again, it's warning you, avoid the door seals and the door. A door seal, same as anything on a fridge, should only be cleaned with hot soapy water and a cloth. No abrasive materials and no chemicals, because they will form micro scratches and eventually that will deteriorate the door seal very quickly. Press the tick. Spray an approved oven protector. So this is where this comes into play. Now there are different versions on the market. They're called oven barrier, oven shield, oven guard. They're basically the same thing. Ours is called protector. It's a safe chemical. It's non-hazardous and even on the back of it here, as you can see, just a small warning symbol. It's not corrosive. It could cause you a bit of eye irritation if you've got it in your eye. You spray it onto a cloth or a sponge and you do one film here the base, the sides, the back, and again, as it says, avoid the door seals and the roof of the cavity and do not spray direct into the cavity. Press the tick. You would then put the cook plate back in that you've cleaned. And you can't put the cook plate in wrong. It can go in upside down, back to front, left to right. It's uh, very universal that way. It says gently wipe and clean the area around the door seal. So again, we would have cleaned that with a damp cloth. Replace the cook plate we've done. Press the tick. Now, if we close the door here, now it says open the air filter cover, lift off the magnetic air filter, wash the filter in warm soapy water and dry with a clean dry cloth. Now, as you can see, the green tick symbol has disappeared. You cannot do anything else until you take this step. So what we do is we lower the front here. There's the filter. It's magnetically interlocked. So we take it out, we'd give it a wipe. You pop it back on. Now the green tick has appeared, it knows you've done that feature or function. You press that, just give the oven a wipe. You see it's saying, uh, after the oven turns off, wipe down the outside of the oven. That would be with your own sanitizer, especially the areas you would touch with a your fingers. So you'd spray a nice clean sanitizer, clean everything off there. Press the tick. Cleaning program complete, please confirm to turn off the oven. Now, there's a feature here where you can engage or disengage, and this is a product sign-off or cleaning sign-off. Now, if we've got it engaged, it brings up a keyboard. You don't have to have this engaged, you can actually disable it in the settings if you wish, but for me, this means now, I have to sign to say I cleaned the oven, I press the tick, that information now gets recorded, so whoever comes in tomorrow can check who said they cleaned the oven, which will be me. Now, the oven's just gonna go through some system checks, and it's gonna power itself down, and once it's done that, you're complete. Foods. We're gonna go straight to quick serve. We'll turn everything else off. And now, as you can see, the all recipes, the library that's disappeared, that's what the customer would see. Now, like I said, factory generic settings. However, if they wanted to change it to their own, you delete what you don't need, because if you don't need all that factory stuff, why have it there? You can take it all off, delete it, and just have their menu on there. So now all they can do is, for example, place something in the oven, select a category, select a program, and that's what they would see. I'm using this one because there's no microwave because I've got nothing in the oven. So they're just toasting bread and the timer. There's a picture there. If I go away now and you come along, you can just look at the oven and go, oh, I see what's cooking, toast. You haven't got to guess, you haven't got to open the oven. Now, if you did decide to open the oven and go, oh yeah, it is toast. Straight away, the oven's gonna ask you, do you wanna continue, yes or no? Because if you've made a mistake, you would cross it out. If you, were, if you know it's right, you just carry on. However, now, the oven is locked out and you need to get back into it. And there's no way of getting to the keyboard by pressing any buttons. So, what we do, we hold, 
this is the on-off button up here, and it will restart. Now when it restarts, it's going to reboot itself, and you're going to briefly get a screen where the, the cogs and wheel will be, the, set, uh, the settings will be. You need to press that when you see it to be able to then enter your manager password. If you don't do that, it will then go back to QuickServe straight away, preheat itself, so you have to reboot again. So it's now doing some checks. So why did you do that? Because now I want to unlock it for you. Oh yeah, so it's just locked out? Yeah, because you're locked out all day now. Which is great if that's all you're doing, but if you're, as for you here, it's slightly different. You want to play with the control panels. You need to be in full serve mode. Okay. So it takes a while to reboot because it is a computer at the end of the day. And then hopefully here it comes. You're going to get the initial screen, like I said, and there'll be a little cog down here which we press. Whereas before on our older softwares, we just used to have an invisible back door button. So, actually this one's switched it off. So we switch it on. Mary Chef well, but press the cog button there. And now we've got the keyboard. So now we can go in, reset the oven so that you can do whatever you want to do. Which generally, when you're training in the oven, you need to be in full serve mode to start with. Um, you just don't show them the password when you're doing the training. Just the manager needs to see the password or whoever's in charge. Then you back out. It will now offer me two temperatures because I've still got it set as off if I wanted it to. I'm oh, sorry, it was set this at 275, didn't we? So now it's, it's back up to temperature and now I can go back to my cookbook. Your press and go section here, if you press that, this is where you can put your favorites, the dishes you use the most. Now, if you've got more than eight, you might as well stick with the cookbook because you've got to start scrolling the screen. So if you've only got eight really good favorite recipes at usual time, you can have them in the press and go section if you wish. But generally, you just have them in your cookbook. Yeah. And once you're set up, like I said, you are a two button press. Yeah. Category program, mm -hmm. job done. But your best sellers could sit on the, on the favorites. Yeah, you could, like I said, you could set it up